I guess to start off with, uh, what do you look for in melanoma lesions and what differentiates melanoma from other skin cancers? And if you want to, if you want to uh, start off by maybe just describing what you do or, or how you examine, what's your approach to patients with melanoma maybe? Hello, everybody, and uh, Adil, thank you so much for inviting me to be here. It's really an honor to see all these faces and um, to be representing uh, melanoma dermatology. Um, I'm a professor of dermatology here at UCSF, and I do research on early screening diagnosis and um, developing methods for accurate diagnosis of melanoma and other skin cancers. So, um, you know, some of the things that we do, of course, are full body skin exams. And we do that in folks that have some um, indicator of an increased risk for developing melanoma. Um, and we currently have a very high resolution um, standardized photographic system that we just put in place last month, I'm very excited about, um, which can actually track changes and can do very high res dermoscopic photos and map it to um, the whole body photos. Um, it's a really nice system that we're starting to get all the uh, folks, all of our patients that previously had photos upgraded to this new system. And um, of course we do inpatient exams with the dermatoscope, which is, a magnified handheld device. Um, and uh, together with longitudinal photos, um, we can pick up new lesions, we can pick up changing lesions. Um, so that's the newest here at UCSF. And in addition, uh, my lab is working to develop non-invasive ways to uh, diagnose skin cancer, including melanoma. What are some of, uh, in terms of AI, do you think uh, time might come when, uh, you know, and, and I've, I've been, you know, we, we've all read and discussed those papers, uh, is do you think a time might come where AI might be able to help or, or uh, people could take pictures or is that, is that just uh, talk mostly? I think it's very exciting and it's on the very near horizon. I think AI can help in a number of ways. Um, for example, AI excels in image analysis. So looking at clinical photos, um, and we've developed a model that can distinguish melanoma from nevi, as have others. Um, it can also look at histopathology, so the slides, um, and we're working on that as well as our others. Um, and combined with molecular medicine, I think AI and machine learning can uh, move the uh, diagnostic accuracy further than it has been um, because AI can synthesize so much data and it can remember so many images. Um, and I think it's really, uh, the proof of concept is there, there's no question. Um, but what we have been working on in our lab and others have been as well is proof of practice. What does it take to bring AI into the clinic? Um, and it's not quite ready for prime time, but uh, we're all working on it to get it there. And certainly with the use of a mobile device to take photos, and I don't know if anybody has an iPhone 13, I don't personally have one, but it turns out my daughter does. And she took the most amazing photo. She sent it to me and said, oh mom, what about this mole? And I'm like, whoa, how did you take that? And she goes, I just took it with my iPhone, you know? And it's pretty amazing. The iPhone 13 actually has LiDAR. I think you might've heard of that with uh, self-driving cars. But um, so the 3D aspect of the images is really remarkable. So even just in your iPhone or your Android, it's pretty amazing. And we now can have um, AI models that run off of these small devices and can keep the data on your phone so you're not sending it anywhere. Um, we actually would load the AI model on your phone and it can just assess your own images. And every now and then you just get a, a push at update of that. So that's what we're looking at. Um, we have not rolled any out um, as a field. We have not done that. There are many, many programs out there that can assess images and suggest whether or not you need to see a physician, but they are not FDA approved to make diagnoses. Um, and they can assess if it's changing, which is very important, but um, moles are always changing to some degree. So the question is, what's a significant change? But I, I am very excited a deal about AI and machine learning in uh, screening and diagnosis of skin cancer. So uh, Maria, just to take a step back, 
Well, can you, and, and maybe I should have uh, asked you uh, earlier, but what is the pigmented lesion clinic? And is that something that's a resource for everybody? Or is that, do you have to have a certain number of molds? Or can you walk us through some of the genetic syndromes and uh, where, that are associated with melanoma? I mean, is, if you have a, if you have a, like a dad or a mom who had mel, is that, is that a familial syndrome or is it, is it have to be much more involved than that? Yeah, great question. Um, so studies have been done and actually Sansi Leachman, whom I both know very well, to put out a paper a couple of years ago that determined that when is it, when is your family history or personal history significant for a potential genetic link to the risk of getting melanoma? And, um, and the magic number is three. So if you or first degree relatives together have three melanomas, that's significant. If you yourself have three melanomas, that's significant. Um, and then we also look for the genes that give you an increased risk for melanoma can often give you increased risk for certain internal cancers. And those would be significantly pancreatic cancer which is typically a rare cancer, but it uh, occurs in association with melanoma when you inherit a certain gene variant. Um, kidney cancer, uh, certain brain cancers. Um, and they're also, those are, um, those are genetic syndromes that are primarily melanoma and internal um, cancers of one or two types. But there are other syndromes, for example, lee Falmani syndrome, which gives you many different kinds of cancer and melanoma is part of that. But typically what you'll see is on one side of your family, um, there'll be you know, at least three relatives with cancer and possibly in let's say three generations, right? A grandfather, a parent and yourself. So the magic number is three. That's when we start to think about a genetic syndrome. That's super interesting to know that you have to have three uh, relatives to, 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 see, to really say that you've got a familial history uh, what do you think about these new tests, like the Castle Decision DX test? Do you use them? What, what do you think? Do you, do you think people should be aware of them or should use them for, or is there a certain threshold or a certain type of patient that you like to consider them for? Yeah, you know, this is a very interesting topic, deal, and um, suitable for a whole hour discussion itself. But the Castle test, for those that are not familiar with it, is a test that is done on the tumor and they look at the mRNA and it's called gene expression profiling. So they're looking at the total amount of RNA in that tumor and what species it has. And there's a certain profile that will um, predict whether or not that melanoma will go on to recur or um, metastasize to a distant um, organ or site. And um, I'm part of a national group called the Melanoma uh, Prevention Working Group. And we have looked at not just the CASEL test, but there are others that are available, actually commercially available, but not as well known. Um, and uh, the, the issue is that it has a lot of promise, okay? And um, there are several dermatologists that I know and around the country that are using the CASEL test. Um, the difficulty is that while the Castle test can be useful in certain situations, it can also present conundrums or difficulties in management because it's so new. So if you get a positive and meaning a positive being class 2B in a Castle test, it's not clear what the next step would be, uh, what kind of surveillance. It just tells you that you have a higher risk than perhaps the next person. Um, but we don't know, should we do PET CTs? Should we do ultrasounds? What frequency should we do those tests? Um, those are unanswered questions. And those are things that uh, CASEL is starting to work on. I know there are several studies out there ongoing. Um, so I do think that these types of tests have a lot of promise, deal, but um, again, possibly not exactly ready for prime time. And I do use it in certain rare cases when you, for example, can't do a sentinel lymph node biopsy, or if the sentinel lymph node biopsy was attempted and they didn't find a lymph node, right, in those cases. Um, but otherwise, I don't use it on a routine basis. 
It's uh, it, it, and and do you uh, and 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 this is just a question for everybody uh, and 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 including the surgeons who are on. Uh, is there a feeling that the Castle test could be a supplementary to central lymph node biopsy, or like a complementary test to central lymph node biopsy, or, or is there? Do you get more information from the Castle test that you don't get from, or vice versa? Yes, I do think that it is valuable together with the central lymph node um, biopsy. Currently, it is not standard of care to do the Castle test alone. Uh, standard of care would still be to follow the guidelines to do a sentinel lymph node biopsy. And then um, it is optional, but not recommended to do the castle test because sometimes it can muddy the waters. But I did do a um, collaborative study with the Castle Corporation, and we looked at 1,500 melanoma cases, and we looked to see if it provided additional information together with the sentinel lymph node biopsy. And the answer is yes. Um, it can predict a little bit more fine-tuned who would go on to metastasize and what percentage and who will not. And it's useful, I guess, in the sense, if you have a ne negative sentinel lymph node biopsy sometimes, um, but uh, those things are currently still works in progress to get the final answer, yeah. I have a couple more questions. What is, what is an effective uh, strategy for UV prevention? Uh, I know I get asked that and I ask you that all the time. But uh, what if you're if you've had melanoma in the past, or or even if you haven't, uh, what is an effective strategy? I mean, should you uh, cover yourself up totally, hide in indoors? Should you never go out? Should you be out some of the time? Or what what do you suggest? I don't advocate not going out because I think it's very important to get exercise. Uh, fresh air is so good for you in other ways, um, but um, as dermatologists, we do advocate, especially for people with a history of melanoma or a strong family history, to cover up. And, um, you know, sunscreen is very popular. And um, when I ask my patients what they do, the number one answer is sunscreen. And that's great, but we really think of covering up as being primary, and there's several reasons for that. Um, what I mean by cover up would be a broad brimmed hat as opposed to a baseball cap, uh, long sleeves, long pants standing in the shade whenever you can, because that's actually very effective. Um, now, sunscreen is really secondary because studies have shown very clearly, if we compare people who do sunscreen alone and hat alone or standing in the shade alone, and we monitor their vitamin D, vitamin D is actually a surrogate for how much sun you're getting, the people using sunscreen alone have no change in their vitamin D, whereas the people wearing hats and standing in the shade have a plunge in their vitamin D, suggesting that sunscreen as it's being used is not as effective as we might like. And that's, we're just actually putting together a paper now that shows that actually every single person that comes to my clinic, doesn't matter if they have a history of melanoma, family history or no history, is putting on a, you know half to a third of the sunscreen that they need. That's recommended to reach the SPF protection on the bottle. The other thing is that the SPF protection rating on the bottle here in the United States only refers to UVB. It does not refer to UVA, even though it says UVA and UVB protection. That UVA protection is not monitored, nor is it measured. The FDA is trying to put in regulations to um, have a minimal standard of UVA protection now in the US, but that got stalled out. Um, they were just working on that right before COVID and they kind of got overwhelmed with COVID things. So it's kind of on the back burner. But just remember that um, when you use the sunscreen, you're getting adequate UVB protection if you use it at the recommended levels, which um, in my study, nobody is. And it's actually a, a little much to use it at the recommended levels. Um, the second is that it sweats off and it wipes off and um, you have to reapply. Whereas if you're wearing a hat, long sleeves, long pants, uh, you don't need to worry about that. Now I do recommend sunscreen under the hat because there's a significant amount of scattered and reflected light that comes through. Um, so uh, we do, and we you know sometimes you can't um, necessarily do this, but we do recommend that you do your activities if you can before 10 and after three. Um, of course that can't always be done, but that also minimizes the UVB. Now UVA is relatively the same throughout the day. And people say that mineral sunscreen, I've heard people say that mineral sunscreen is better or 
it's more, or maybe it's safer for the coral reefs or, and I've heard vice versa. And I've heard people say that zinc oxide is better versus titanium uh, and micronized is doesn't work or you, it has to be white for it to be, you know, protect. Is, is that is there truth to that? Or is it any sunscreen that you can get is better than no sunscreen? And basically that's what we know. Well, sunscreen has several issues. Um, one is the degree of protection, right? And here in the United States, we have not approved several of the effective ingredients that Europe and Canada has. So um, that are not known to be harmful to the um, coral reefs. Um, and so currently we dermatologists recommend ordering it online. There's a pharmacy in Canada um, that you can order the uh, sunscreen that has the adequate ingredients. Um, that's number one, that's, um, that's chemical sunscreens. The physical sunscreens are definitely good and excellent in the sense that the chemical sunscreens have to be used at a certain volume on your skin, as I mentioned. Um, the zinc and titanium sunscreens, you can use it at a thin layer and still get this SPF. And that's because they're nanoparticles and as thin as you can make it, it's not thinner than the nanoparticles. So you've got one layer of nanoparticles on there. And we've tested that in the lab actually. Um, so the disadvantage of the physical sunscreen of course, is that it makes most people look a little bit white and some people don't like that. Um, but in terms of protection, it's excellent. And there's a question from uh, Alicia Michaud saying, uh, what are the ingredients to look for in sun? What are the helpful ingredients to look for in sunscreen? Yeah, it's Tinterex and um, Mexarel. And if you look it up in, uh, there's a Canadian pharmacy, which I can actually provide to a deal. I don't have it right here on this computer, um, but um, La Roche-Posay actually out of Canada has those ingredients. Um, and um, you can get SPF 50. Um, here in the United States, the, um, the zinc and titanium sunscreens that would have uh, coverage would be SPF 50 out of, and Neutrogena has just put out a F SPF 50 uh, last month that has 22% zinc or titanium, and that's what you're looking for. Prior to uh, last month, the highest was something like 10, 15%, and that didn't give you enough. But if you look for 50 SPF, Zinc titanium, 22%, um, that will give you uh, what you need. But uh, for somebody like me with a little um, color in my skin, it makes me white. But um, I don't mind if I'm exercising. I, I wouldn't necessarily go to a wedding like that, but uh, for you know day-to-day -day exercise, it's fine. Uh, what, uh, and, and Maria, if you would mind describing your research interests, just so that, uh, just for, so everybody knows, and I have one final question for you, which is that, you know, we do see a lot of our drugs, like especially MEK inhibitors, BRAF inhibitors, uh, they cause a lot of skin rashes. Uh, I know many of our patients have, have you know, extensive experience with, with dealing with them. Uh, do you have any words of wisdom on that? Or is it just so individual that you just have to see, you know, stuff and, and decide on a patient-to-patient on -patient basis? Um, Adil, so are you asking um, what should they look for? Is that what you're asking? Well, what is a what is an effective uh, like prevention strategy? I guess for for rashes from from MEK inhibitors and ah, from BRAF inhibitors. Well, from ba basically from MEK inhibitors. I see. Um, well, you know they often uh, lead to expression of occult um, uh, keratinocytic neoplasms. And so, um, you know, it's a good question. I, I had not thought perhaps to deal, we should discuss this more. In these patients, perhaps we should treat them with Effudex actually. To, to, um, to like, for, for like those. And actually now it, there's, you know, Effudex can be quite severe. Anybody who's used it, 5-FU, 5-4-U-Cell or Effudex, they can get a very um, sort of exuberant, almost sunburny like, uh, reaction, but now we have a modified uh, where we use Effudex with calcitriene, and it's only twice a day for four days, and we've been getting very good results. So that might be something to think about to pre-treat before you yeah. start them on a MEK inhibitor. Um, I think that's an excellent question, Adil, and we should try that. 
We should, we should let, let's try that. Someone would like to know the specific Neutrogena sunscreen you should be looking for. Um, and so that would be the zinc and titanium SPF 50 with a percentage of zinc or titanium at 22%, 21, 22%. That will give you good protection against UVB and UVA. Um, and the one that I have happens to be a stick. Um, and I haven't looked for the lotion. I just found the stick and I said, oh, that's great. Um, because it doesn't really run, you know, getting you just put it on and, and then it doesn't, uh, That's yeah. Right. But I do, uh, just caution you that it is white. It just makes you a little white, but again, I didn't really mind if I'm going to do exercise. Oh, okay. Oh, hello to Sid, by the way, that's, <laughs> um, and, um, so, you know, my lab, uh, traditionally has been a melanoma lab, um, but my, my interests have evolved into disorders that really are defined by the intersection of genetics, the environment, and behavior, which melanoma falls squarely in that. And the other one is atopic dermatitis. And I'm very interested in A, bringing precision medicine to the diagnosis of skin cancer, and also increasing access to the diagnosis of skin cancer. And that's why I'm working on technology. I do do machine learning and AI, um, and we're working on a number of parallel um, uh, efforts to do early diagnosis. And another um, unrelated, but possibly interesting too, is um, the effect of air pollution on the skin. And we've done a number of studies. Um, and I just want to let you know that here in the Bay Area, as you know, we're subject to wildfires and depending on how close you are to those areas, you will have more or less. Um, and wildfires cause an increase in melanoma. As we see in firefighters, they have a significant increase in melanomas. Now these are folks that are, of course, at close proximity and um, longitudinally, repetitively um, exposed. But one thing that is unknown is how much does it take, right, to increase your risk. So that is a uh, point of research interest. And also if you have atopic dermatitis or eczema, it will also be affected by wildfire pollution and other pollution. So that's quick brief uh, summary of uh, some of the things we do in my lab. Thanks so much, Adil. It's been a lot of fun. Great. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I think there's a question from Laura Callahan uh, about, uh, about CT DNA and MRD. Uh, and uh, I can answer that, or, or sure, yeah, if you want to take a step. Yeah, it's, we, we do the, it's, it's offered by, uh, there, there are a lot of companies that are offering CT DNA monitoring, you know, like Natera and Signatera and, and different companies. We, we, we yeah, yes, we, we do use uh, them on occasion. I, I think that the, the, the problem with the CT DNA test is that it isn't totally 100% clear what value they're really contributing to scans and things like that. But, but they could be useful. We have three panelists today. We have uh, Dr. Vernon Sondak, my former mentor and director of the Cutaneous Oncology Program at Moffitt Cancer Center. Uh, we also have Dr. Ajay Maker, who is uh, head of surgical oncology at UCSF and uh, has an interest in melanoma, and Michael Alvarado, who's our melanoma surgeon, who I've worked with for many, many years. And actually, we both worked at Moffitt at Cancer Center. So with that, maybe I'll ask uh, uh, Vern to start off. And, uh, and Vern, can you describe central lymph node biopsy and the MSLT1 and MSLT2 trials? And where do we stand with central lymph node biopsy today? Sure. Well, central node biopsy has now been around for a long, long time. It's hard to believe. It's more than 30 years we've been using sentinel node biopsy because we know that for most localized melanomas, uh, the first place it spreads, if it's ever going to spread beyond the skin, is to the lymph nodes. And we know that the sentinel node biopsy technique in most cases can allow us to find that tumor-containing lymph node before it becomes large enough to be seen on any clinical test or felt on any doctor's examination. So uh, it has been shown over and over again that 
melanomas as they get thicker have a higher chance of spreading to the lymph nodes, that melanomas, once they get about 0.75 millimeters thick, get above a 5% chance of having a positive lymph node. And so in general, for a healthy person who has no other uh, reason to avoid a major surgery that doesn't often involve general anesthesia, a sentinel node added to the wide excision of the melanoma is an appropriate staging test. So well, let me un unpack that a little bit. One, it's done at the same time as the wide excision. It's not something we want to do after the person has already had the melanoma widely removed. I'm not talking about the biopsy. That's not a wide removal. I'm talking about the more definitive, larger uh, surgery. Occasionally, the original melanoma isn't even biopsied. It's just widely removed. We try to avoid that because it does complicate going back for that sentinel lymph node biopsy. So it's done at the same time um, under anesthesia, and it is a staging procedure. We remove only a couple of lymph nodes. The pathologists look at them and tell us yes or no, we see cancer in this lymph node or we don't. And if we do see cancer, how much, how much, uh, what's the size of the cancer in the lymph node? What percent of the lymph node is taken up? Where is it in the lymph node? All of these are things the pathologist can tell us. Um, and we make many major treatment decisions based on the outcome of the sentinel node biopsy. Unlike some of the other potential predictive tests we heard about, like the gene expression profiles, this is one test where I think every doctor who does it says, here's what we do if it's positive, and here's why. With every other kind of test, whether it's gene expression, whether it's CT DNA, whether it's even, I just like to do PET scans on everybody. You have to say, well, what do you do then? Well, you know, I kind of sometimes I do something a little different, sometimes I don't. For 30 years, sentinel node biopsy has helped us do things um, in a very, very standardized fashion that have allowed the development of um, adjuvant therapies, which we'll hear a lot more about later on, treatments to decrease the risk of melanoma coming back. And one of the real byproducts of Sentinel Node as we look back 30 years later, when I started my career, which was more than 30 years ago, and I worked with Dr. Don Morton, the developer of the Sentinel Lymph Node Biopsy during my, he developed it during my training and we, we started doing it back in the 1980s and tried to figure out what it would be useful for and, what it wouldn't be. What it has done is dramatically decrease the number of people who've needed all of their lymph nodes removed from their arm or their leg. So many, many fewer lymph patients have all their lymph nodes removed. Some people still need it, but that's the key. The ones today who are getting node dissections, complete lymph node removals, really need it. They're not getting it on an 80% or a 20% or a 15% chance they might need it. They're getting it on a demonstrated need. And uh, it's been really a remarkable transformation to see how many fewer patients are having their lymph nodes completely removed and yet still doing extremely well um, from a standpoint of their melanoma. Great. Thank you. So uh, maybe I should uh, turn to uh, Michael. I, I see him here. Uh, so if you had a patient who was uh, like, let's just say 60 years old, and <laughs> which I'm coming to, but, uh, uh, but and, and has a, uh, let's just say 4.5 millimeter thickness melanoma. So, uh, and, and uh, no alteration. So in that case, would you still say, and, and let's just say, just hypothetically, it's on the it's it's like in the it's in the chest. Uh, would you still go ahead and do a, a, a central lymph node biopsy, knowing that there's multiple drainage areas and it's uh, somewhat complicated, 
or would you say, well, we, we, we kind of have that adjuvant therapy information uh, or what, 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 what's your position on that? Yeah, I think even in the, those types, those thicker melanomas, there's very good uh, prognostic information gathered from the sentinel node biopsy. Um, and if it's, you know, if there's no contraindication to surgery, I think it's a great way to help give information um, to you and, um, you know, for example, the oncologist and to the patient for, you know, for prognosis. Uh, I think um, there's some good data that even for thicker melanomas that there's, I mean, this is from older older data before immunotherapy uh, with interferon and, and identifying patients with thicker melanomas that may have benefited more from adjuvant therapy that were node positive. Um, yeah, so I think for the thicker melanoma, I think absolutely that, you know, unless it's a contraindication to surgery, I think there's good prognostic information uh, for that patient. With the hey. caveat that w- there is one caveat that I have to mention that I, I didn't work with a deal when he was <laughs> Moffitt. I was actually a fellow. And so um, although now I almost consider myself a colleague of Dr. Sondak, he is my mentor. And so the caveat would be, unless Dr. Sondak says <laughs> otherwise. <laughs> no, you are a colleague and I do agree. And I would just say one more little thing. Again, that group of patients that you talked about, the thicker, melanoma like that, 4.5 millimeters. Remember I said even at at 0.75 millimeters, we're thinking about sentinel nodes because we're above a 5% risk. At at 4.5, we're above a 30 or more percent risk of a positive node. If we don't do the sentinel node and just say, well, you're high risk, we'll just treat everybody high risk the same without knowing what's in the lymph nodes, the ones who have it in the lymph node and don't know about it are going to wind up needing a lymph node dissection much, much more often than they would have if they had it removed as a sentinel node. So that's another reason. It's not intuitively obvious, but it's, it, it's part of why we're still very um, uh, convinced that doing a sentinel node is important even in patients receiving treatment. And I will also say another important reason we continue to do sentinel nodes across the board is to try to drive research forward. If we don't know who has a positive node and who doesn't, we don't tend to put those people on the research studies. We don't tend to learn more. I don't think any of us believe we've got all the answers yet. And so um, there's, there's still a lot to be gained by knowing who has a positive node and doing the things early on to minimize the likelihood they'll need a node dissection and get them into research trials when it's appropriate. I see uh, Dr. Maker there, uh, who is uh, all uh, gowned up and booted up. And and, uh, I, I, so, uh, maybe I can ask you guys all to comment on a hypothetical patient. Let's just say, uh, we see somebody who is like, say, 65 years old and had a melanoma on the arm and then now has some uh, bulky lymph nodes in the armpit. Uh, can you explain what uh, neoadjuvant therapy is, adjuvant therapy is, and what's, what's your approach to that? And maybe start with uh, Dr. Maker. Sure. Yeah, thanks for the invitation to be on this. And it's uh, really so wonderful to see almost 100 people on this call. Uh, This is wonderful. So, you know, the way we approach this in 2022 is going to actually be very different than this was approached even in 2010, uh, and certainly is very different than it was approached in 1980. So for the scenario that you brought up, which is a a melanoma on the arm, and then some uh, large uh, lymph nodes in the armpit that you can actually feel, So the first thing we need to figure out is whether those things that are being felt have anything to do with the melanoma at all. And if they are in fact able to be felt, then a a quick little needle biopsy that can be done even in the office would be the first step. And if that did in fact prove that that was melanoma, then we would want to make sure that it has not spread to other potential parts of the body. And we have such high resolution imaging now uh, that that can be done uh, in that in that setting, 
And so a PET CT scan is potentially uh, a nice first approach that there's other uh, scans that can be done uh, depending on uh, what's available to you. And if really all that exists is a melanoma on the arm and a positive known uh, lesion in the armpit, in the quote unquote all day, old days, we would go straight to the operating room and remove all of those lymph nodes from the armpit. But what you're alluding to, Dr. Dowd, is are there other things we can do besides surgery in this day and age? And the answer is yes. And I think most people in that setting would start with a treatment through the bloodstream first, rather than going straight to surgery. And that's called neoadjuvant. Neo meaning first. And uh, it's interesting, neoadjuvant is almost a juxtaposition. I've never really thought about it. But uh, we're, we're giving therapy first before surgery. And nowadays, that would most likely be with, uh, with immunotherapy. And there's a couple different immunotherapies that I'm sure will be touched on later in this by uh, yourself and, and your colleagues. But checkpoint blockade immunotherapy would, in most cases, be the first approach with the hope of allowing one's immune system that recognizes the melanoma as foreign to start attacking it in the lymph nodes and throughout the body uh, and for that to be the first step. For that uh, same hypothetical uh, patient, uh, uh, Dr. Sondak and Alvarado, what, what, what would you guys do? Would you, would you prefer new adjuvant therapy or would you do the surgery first? Uh, or where do we stand today? Uh, at, at Moffitt, we are strong advocates of treatment first, surgery later. Uh, and what I say to every patient in this sort of situation, a patient who has an enlarged lymph node comes in with the enlarged lymph node. It's not something that's already been taken out beforehand, but we can feel it. We can see it on that PET scan. Maybe we can see it's the only lymph node. It's no longer a question of what do we do? It's a question of what do we do first? And if we're going to do surgery and drug treatment, it only makes sense we should do them in the order that is, gives us the most advantages. Doing surgery gives you the advantage of knowing exactly what you're uh, dealing with and knowing it's out and people want that. Oh, it's out, it's out, I want that out. But keeping the tumor in and treating the patient while the tumor's in before the surgery has much bigger advantages. And the biggest advantage of all is that we can tell if the treatment worked or not. And when I say we, I'm, I, can, I mean, it isn't me that can tell, it's the pathologist who can now tell. And I say that recognizing that there have been many times when we've now given treatment before surgery, and I've thought it didn't work at all. I thought it was completely useless. And the pathologist says, you're wrong. You obviously don't know anything about melanoma. The tumors are totally dead. Everything you've seen is just leftovers, just inflammation. We never even imagined that this was possible. Um, and so we're starting, we're taking the first baby steps toward thinking about if we do treatment first, can we do a lot less treatment? And can we do a lot less surgery? And the answer is today, Maybe not, but soon I think we're going to be seeing all of these things uh, fit in and so that that first few weeks or months of treatment is going to potentially change the whole subsequent treatment course uh, in ways that, that we never thought possible before. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean... I think one of the downs, one of the hard parts about melanoma, and Dr. Sondek and uh, Dr. Dowd and Dr. Maker know this as well, is that for so long the treatments weren't that great. This the 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 whole body treatments, you know, there weren't any good chemotherapies and there weren't any good immunotherapies back in the day. There was interferon and it really didn't work that well. So all of these other cancers were getting treated this way because there were good good therapies. So breast cancer you know, pretty standard now to get chemotherapy up front if it's in the lymph node. You know, colon cancer, if it had already spread, getting the chemotherapy up front and these targeted therapies. So 
finally, uh, as the discovery of these newer systemic or whole body therapies, now allow the, the melanoma teams to do these same type of, of uh, treatment strategies where you get treated up front. And I think it's, it's great, as Dr. Sondek was just saying, and, and Dr. Dowd and I um, have done this uh, in a number of patients in the last seven years in terms of looking at initially treating with you know one type of therapy and not having to put the patient into a lot of really, really terrible side effects with multi-drug treatment and seeing a very, very good response and realizing that, wow, they're, they're gonna do great with just this treatment. So I think it's a, it's a great option um, to learn um, um, about this. Also, clinical trial-wise now, um, learning more about newer drugs and, and how well they work. And so I think, and then as Dr. Sondek said, you know, potentially doing less, I'm, I mean, as Dr. Sondek, I've seen patients that I think, okay, why is Dr. Dowd sending me this patient? There's no way that this will ever be able to be removed. And <clears throat> lo and behold, you know, four months later, six months later, it's like, wow, what, that, that gigantic thing has melted away. And now we can go in and check. And as Dr. Sondek was saying, even though it looks like there might be something left, um, the pathologist saying that there's no tumor left there. So I think it's, it's a great option. And um, it really has helped, you know, treating our patients in the, in the whole group kind of dynamic. So maybe I can uh, turn to all three of you guys and say and, and ask you to comment on metastatectomy. I, I know that's something that we've done for years. You know, I, I still have patients who maybe had uh, had a had a liver metastasis taken out or a lung metastasis taken out, like I want to say twenty years ago. Uh, but uh, what what is our what what do people think about uh, removing distant not not, not not regional metastases, but distant metastases, is that, is that still a valid treatment option or is that something that we're putting on a back burner now? I think from my thought process, I think one of the most important questions is how safe can you do it? Um, with not a lot of great data for long-term outcomes that you, know, you don't wanna put the patient at a risk of having a significant complication or significant change in quality of life, um, you know, from the actual surgery itself. So I think that first and foremost needs to be kind of weighed up front, you know, how, you know, how, how dangerous is the surgery um, to the patient? You know, what are the potential outcomes from that surgery? Is it, you know, is it a, a surgery that has a risk of death from the surgery? Or is it a, a chance of a severe comorbidity or, or you know, uh, morbidity associated with, with the surgery? So I think that obviously is, is a, a big important question. I mean, I think we've had patients that have had, you know, metastatic, you know, cutaneous um, findings, you know, melanoma started on the left arm and now there's something on the lower back in the subcutaneous tissue or something in the leg. And I think those obviously are usually pretty easy to, to be done, but I think also to be able to remove those is one thing, but um, I'm sure as you, have clinical trials open and such sometimes, although it's, it's hard for patients, if you have something and they want it out, obviously, but to be able to go on a clinical trial and monitor, you know, how well drugs are working or how well systemic therapies are working. And sometimes if you remove that the patient doesn't have the opportunity to go on that clinical trial or go on that drug or something like that. So I think there are a number of things that need to go into the discussion up front. That, that would be my first kind of thought on it. Ajay and, and Vern, do you guys have uh, thoughts about metastatectomy or, or is that something that uh, you think the same? Sure. Yeah, I mean, um, Mike's point is spot on. I mean, the patient first and, and um, if it's doable technically with uh, acceptable morbidity or not. I, the bigger issue, I think, is um, once that's been established, are we improving survival and or quality of life or not? And if the answer to either of those questions is yes, then there's a fantastic role for metastasectomy, right? Because there is no better treatment to remove a cancer than to cut it out. Now that's the hammer, you know, looking at the world as a nail, right? But if you have a tumor and you've cut it out, it is gone. The issue with melanoma, of course, is that it's not just that one tumor 
that we're treating. It's the biology of disease that's the issue. And that gets back to your previous question and what we've all been talking about, which is the role of new adjuvant or additional treatments through the bloodstream that will treat the cancers that we can't see. So where is their role for metastasectomy? Around 2008, there was consideration for a trial. Dr. Sondak mentioned uh, Don Morton. I remember having dinner with him and we were talking at that time about having a trial for up to seven metastases, uh, undergoing clinical trial for complete metastasectomy uh, versus other non-surgical care. Now that was in the era um, before FDA approval of some of the new immunotherapies. And so now metastasectomy should be reserved for patients that have lesions that are causing impingement to quality of life, to pain, to uh, causing intestinal blockages, other things that are really uh, uh, impacting that patient's ability to have a comfortable um, uh, life at that point. And or if they are on treatments that are killing some of the tumors and not others, and so that you could remove the ones that are not responding to treatment, leave the ones that are responding to treatment, and in that way still have either curative intent or at least improvement in overall survival as a goal. So a short answer to your question is, there's a great role for metastasectomy. The long answer is, who is it right for and who is it not right for? And that's, that's the, the harder question to answer. Thank you. Uh, so, Vern, if I could turn to you for a minute and, and ask mm -hmm. you about uh, adoptive cell therapy sure. uh, and TIL therapy. I mean, are, are we at the brink of having that? W what is adoptive cell therapy for those of us so, who might not be as familiar? So we've been talking about removing metastatic tumors, metastasectomy here, with the goal of hopefully curing the person or relieving a blockage or doing something like that. Adoptive cell therapy involves surgery for a totally different reason. It involves surgery to take out a bit of the tumor, deliberately, fully knowing that you're going to leave a lot of cancer behind, maybe in 10 or 20 different places in the body, to get the cells out of that tumor that the, that the immune system sent there to try to kill the cancer, but didn't succeed, okay? We have seen over and over and over again that the immune system can get rid of melanoma, and it usually can't do it on its own. It needs to, something to really rev it up. And now we have drugs that are extremely powerful boosters of the immune system, and sometimes even they don't work. Why don't they work? We think because the tumor itself produces things that the cells, the t immune cells get to the tumor and they're inactivated when they get there. So can we take the tumor out in the laboratory, get the cells out and activate them with drugs even more powerful than anything we can give to a person and when we and grow up an entire army of effective tumor cells? The answer to this is known. Yes, we know we can do this. We know we can take out one tumor, grow the cells out of it, clone them for a month, and give them back to somebody and get their melanoma to go away, sometimes permanently. The issue is how technically complicated that is how difficult and expensive and time consuming, what happens to the patient while they're waiting for those cells to grow up. And right now in the United States today, there's only a handful of places in the country that have the facilities needed to grow these uh, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes or TIL. Um, and so it's very, very limited. And in a place like Moffitt, we have the technology to do it. And we could do maybe one or two patients a month on our own where we could grow up the till and give it, give it to them. The, the world's catching up with us, though. Other treatments for leukemias, for lymphoma have involved 
growing up cells at a central location and mailing them all around the country and helping docs um, administer these cells, even if they couldn't grow them in their own hospital. And that's what's beginning to happen with TIL. Research studies have shown that um, we can send a piece of the tumor to a central laboratory, have that lab do all the work and mail those cells back and do it, do it at a hundred times a day, do it for 50 different places and keep a, a large number of patients getting treated in places that could never do it on their own. The FDA has, I expect that sometime in this year in 2022, the FDA will sign off on that. And for the first time, people will have the option of saying, I want to get till not on a research project, not in a center that is just doing it on their own, but as part of a national uh, program that's, that's more complicated than getting a drug administered, but is essentially the same thing. We're making a drug from your own um, uh, tumor in your own cells. I, I expect that to happen this year. Great. Uh, so maybe if I can ask you guys to take a, a minute or two and just talk about like, what do you think is really exciting in surgical oncology for melanoma and, or, or where do you think the horizon is today? So one of the things that I'm really excited about, I hinted at it earlier, is can we use these treatments to what we say de-escalate care, do less treatment? Could I give somebody one or two treatments of immune therapy, for example, and instead of taking out all their lymph nodes, take out one big lymph node and essentially convert them from having to have a full lymph node dissection to having a glorified sentinel lymph node procedure. And uh, uh, some colleagues of ours in the Netherlands started this, uh, reported it just this past, uh, about two weeks ago uh, or less at the ASCO meeting, just published it a few days after that. We have done this on a very, very small number of patients, patients who in the past would have had no alternative but to have all the lymph nodes removed and a year of treatment who are now getting a few weeks to a couple of months of treatment, one lymph node removed, and some of them are having no other treatment than that. So I, I think we're not there yet, but we're on the verge of being able to give a lot less care with this, a lot less treatment with the same outcome for some of our patients. And concentrate, give the, that means the ones who are getting the full court press are the ones who need it. And the ones who can get by with less, we're able to, the day will come when we'll be able to pick them out and, and say, good news, you don't need all of that treatment. Michael and Ajay, do you guys have, uh, what, what do you think, uh, you know, in terms of what are the exciting developments that you're looking forward to, like maybe the next year or two? Yeah, I, I'll build a little bit on what Dr. Sondak was talking about, which is de-escalating, uh, which has been the natural history of how we've been treating melanoma for the last few decades, but really some exciting things are coming in the pipeline. I'll start with one from a surgical perspective and the other more in the scientific perspective. From the surgical perspective, there's a randomized trial that's going on right now called the Melmark trial. And that is comparing wider margins for removing a primary melanoma to a much smaller margin than what we've traditionally been using. And if that trial shows that the smaller margin is as good as a larger margin, we can do much smaller surgeries for our patients in some cases, maybe even under just local anesthetic, um, because the margin will be so small, much less flaps, much less, less need for skin grafts, et cetera. And so I think that trial, which will be coming to conclusion, uh, and then the, the long-term data will need to be studied, but that's a big trial that's coming down the pike. From the, the uh, systemic treatment, meaning treatments outside of surgery, 
the new immunotherapies that are coming about that are more than just treating T cells, which Dr. Sondak was referring to with the adoptive cell transfer, are coming now, meaning there's other immune cells besides T cells that we know play a significant role in managing the ability of melanoma to spread. And those have names like macrophages and myeloid-derived suppressor cells. Those are just two to name a few. And as these immunotherapies start to be used, I think what we will find is that patients that we uh, before considered untreatable or only treatable to gain some time will be able to get towards curative intent therapies, meaning some of the, and hopefully many of the lesions will have complete responses to these newer immunotherapies. And for the ones that don't, we can still use surgery to remove those unresponsive tumors and thereby treat the whole body with combination approaches um, to get that patient on towards curative intent. And these newer agents coming down the line, many of them are in clinical trials here through uh, your group at UCSF, and I know at Moffitt and others, many are being presented at ASCO, ASCO a few weeks ago. And this is a, a very burgeoning field because melanoma is considered one of the most responsive cancers to immunotherapies. And often it's the first type of cancer in which these uh, new drugs are tested because we know that melanoma is a more sensitive malignancy. So I'm very excited for, for what's coming in that sense. Great, thank you. Yeah, I and so I would say similar to both, so a couple of things. So one, as Dr. Sondak was saying, you know, de-escalation. As a, as a surgical oncologist, I also do a lot of breast cancer surgery and breast cancer has had very good uh, progress in de-escalation surgically. And, but they always had these great systemic therapies or whole body therapies. And now that we've been seeing so much better use of immunotherapies and, and response to therapies, just as Dr. Sondek was saying, I think moving away from these large lymph node surgeries, I think is, is a huge, can be a huge change in quality of life for patients. And I think we will definitely be seeing in the near future that, that that's going to be something that should be we should be moving towards doing less in these big lymph node surgeries. So that's one thing. The second thing I think that kind of goes along with that, I think it was touched on a little bit um, by, by um, Dr. Wei earlier as well, is, um, is this kind of uh, residual disease or uh, liquid biopsy, um, uh, circulating tumor DNA, et cetera. And maybe utilizing that also as a way to think about what surgery might need to be done um, in these big lymph node surgeries, maybe combining, um, you know, response to therapy by imaging, uh, as well as circulating a tumor that that may give us more information for de escalating in these big surgery surgical cases. And then last thing that also Dr. Wade mentioned and, and, and you is that I think there is some good data with the castle test. Um, in a, in a limited number of patients. And I've been using it in my practice, obviously with, with discussions with patients about potential avoidance or avoiding sentinel node biopsy in patients that typically would have qualified for it. So someone, you know, patients over the age of 65, maybe that have melanomas in the one millimeter range that typically would always qualify for sentinel node biopsy. But I think, you know, the castle data is looking pretty good. I think if they have the lowest um, risk category and the risk of a positive lymph node drops potentially way down to less than 5%, uh, less than 3%, that this might be a, a good patient population to have the discussion about not needing a sentinel node biopsy potentially, um, especially in those patients that you would never treat them anyway, even if they had a positive, if they have a small amount of uh, disease in a sentinel node. So I think, I think, you know, we see, I think all of us see, uh, there is a large group of 70 plus year old patients that have one millimeter melanomas and, you know, uh, 75 year olds and, and such. And so I think that, that is, I think is also an area potentially for deescalation um, where it, it may be helpful as well. So our next uh, uh, guests are uh, Dr. Katie Sai and Dr. Greg Daniels. Uh, Dr. Sai is my colleague here at UCSF. 
and Dr. Daniels is at uh, UCSD Moore's Cancer Center in San Diego. So maybe I can have uh, Greg and Kitty uh, and uh, ask, maybe start off with uh, what do you guys see at ASCO or AACR or SITSI that excites you and uh, maybe go from there. Um, sure. Thanks, Adil, for inviting me. And I just want to say you're now the Terry Gross of Zoom. Um, <laughs> we, this discussion has been very good. I, I model myself on Terry Gross. I, I, I have the Terry Gross cup. <laughs> I almost started crying. But um, for me, um, you know, each year, especially this last decade, has brought kind of such excitement to care and options for patients. Um, I, I didn't even count the number of uh, melanoma abstracts this year, but uh, it was in excess of 400, I'm sure. And it used to be that um, melanoma and immune therapy was one of those Tuesdays, last day of ASCO kind of sessions. And now they, it's not uncommon to be in the plenary top and uh, really leading the field. So. It's, it's just been great, um, you know, haven't solved everything yet. I think, you know, one, one of the studies that um, I think was a little underpresented, um, it, it seemed to me, um, was the DreamSeq. And um, that's, you know, the large randomized study that um, came out trying to identify, hey, we have all these great options, which should come first? And, um, there's been you know, so much discussion over the years of combination of targeted therapies and, and immune therapies and do they interact and you know, really interesting research questions that you know, get people thinking and scratching their head. But until we have the trial, we just don't know. Um, people just aren't mice. And um, Dr. Atkins, I think, really kind of has laid it to rest as far as the current um, targeted therapies and checkpoints in, in stating that um, if possible, um, patients should get combination checkpoint therapy prior to their BRAF inhibitors. Um, and as you know, they closed the study early because the signal was so strong for outcomes being better in people who started with checkpoints. So, that was just great to see because it brings up so many other questions um, about why and how that's being done and optimal exposures and things like that. That I think over the next couple of years, um, you know, hopefully AACR and SITSI will start to dissect those things out better. Were you surprised at the outcome of that study or was it one of, one of those things where you were like, oh yeah, I knew that was gonna happen and it's, uh... Yeah. No surprise. So I must say that I am wrong nine, at, nine times out of 10 in predicting the outcomes of studies. Um, but this one, I actually did have hesitation. Um, and we did not open this one at UCSD um, because I, I really had some hesitation there on um, my background was always, um, you know, the reason I got into oncology was immune therapy. So I had this built-in bias that immune therapies were better. So it was yeah, I wasn't surprised, but now that it's out there, it's it's really established. So that's very helpful. So maybe I should turn to Dr. Sai. Katie, were you surprised, or or, or what did you personally think was the was the coolest stuff in the last year or so? Um, nice to see everyone here. Um, I actually um, so yes, now a colleague of Dr. Dowd's. Um, I was just uh, listening with interest. I don't know if this means at all all paths lead to Florida or not, um, or if we can trace all of our academic lineage to Dr. Sondak, um, who I now have the pleasure of sitting on one of the ASCO systemic guidelines for melanoma with, um, but maybe that's true. Maybe all things <laughs> lead to Florida. Um, so I think with the DreamSeq trial, you know, I, um, you know, to make a long story short, you know, that uh, kind of pivotal trial was the first randomized clinical trial evidence we had that for for our patients who have BRAF mutant metastatic melanoma, um, 
there was good evidence there that if those patients actually start with combination immunotherapy with IPI plus NEVO, um, that the longer term clinical outcomes actually um, show that those patients do better in the longer term than if they start with molecular targeted therapy. Um, so with the, uh, the BRAF plus MEK inhibitors. Um, was I surprised? Um, I guess, quite frankly, probably not, uh, just because we have um, been able to see how well immunotherapies have done, um, even as a single agent um, over the longer term. Um, but as with anything else, I think there's nuances here, right? Um, I think, you know, certainly for patients for whom immunotherapy may not be a good first line choice for whatever reason. Um, there was a question in the chat earlier, for example, maybe someone has an organ transplant or has severe underlying autoimmune disorders where actually the safety concerns with giving immunotherapy um, are, are really a concern. You know, I don't want anyone to walk away from this, this meeting thinking that you know, they would be getting less than therapy, right? If their oncologist had a good reason to start with BRAF plus MEK um, agents rather than immunotherapy. Um, so there are some nuances there. Um, I guess to get to your other question in terms of exciting things, I am thinking back to ASCO, uh, which was our uh, one of our major um, oncology conference, um, which just happened a couple of weeks ago in Chicago. Um, we can get into the weeds a little bit too, but I think maybe one of my uh, biggest takeaways from all of the you know hundreds of melanoma abstracts, as Dr. Daniels mentioned, um, was really that you know yes, we should celebrate that our drugs have gotten better for the treatment of advanced melanoma. Um, but the more we the more we have, um, I think the more questions get raised, right? About um, what is the best first line therapy? Should we combine them? Should we sequence them? Um, and I think the other big issue is that we know that all melanomas are not built equally, right? You know, as these drugs have been out um, for a longer time, uh, we know that there are clear subtypes of melanoma, mucosal melanoma, acral melanoma, um, that respond very differently to immunotherapies. Um, so, um, you know, for example, we know that mucosal melanoma can have a somewhat uh, lower response rate to immunotherapy compared to your run-of-the-mill uh, skin melanomas or cutaneous melanoma. Um, and so there are a couple of abstracts, one in particular looking at, uh, you know, combining um, small molecule inhibitors plus uh, immunotherapy for metastatic mucosal melanoma. Um, so I think really in our field, the name of the game seems to be combination therapies, whether it's combination immunotherapy or combining immunotherapy plus uh, drugs from different classes in an effort to try and do better than we are now. Uh, great. Yeah, that, that was an interesting uh, mucosal melanoma abstract. Uh, so maybe I can turn back to Greg and ask you, can you describe the differences between checkpoints? Uh, <laughs> And that, that's a really simple question. What are the differences between different checkpoints? How do they work? And uh, what combinations hold the most promise? Okay, yeah, pretty simple question. I think that was two Nobel laureates um, recently. So I'm sure I can summarize it in a, in a sentence. So checkpoints um, are natural points in a healthy immune system that uh, regulate response to something. Um, in this case, an immune response. And um, as you can imagine, um, we want to attack things appropriately, like an infection, um, but we don't want things to get out of control. And so our immune system, which uh, as Dr. Maker alluded to, is made up of many, many, many different types of cells, um, interact in this fight. And uh, kind of there are generals that uh, tell to go and uh, generals that tell to kind of pull back. So with that kind of framework, checkpoints um, that we use in oncology to date um, target three different spots. And, um, you know, in the last three months, oh, by the way, we got another one and that's the lag three. And so there are points in the immune system where if we block these inhibitors, we can potentiate or make a reaction go forward. Um, so most people know 
PD-1, I'm sure in this crowd, everybody knows PD-1. It's um, changed the face of uh, medical oncology. Um, but before that um, was uh, CTLA-4 or, or ipilimumab in, in Uruguay, uh, which really kind of opened up the field um, because Jim Allison um, you know, went after this crazy idea of regulation being the problem. And uh, it turns out he was right. Um, so ipilimumab was approved back in 2011 as a checkpoint. And this one um, allows a reaction to expand and, and go after something a little more broadly. Um, I'm just simplifying. Whereas PD-1 is uh, allowing those soldiers that you just generated in the lymph node to go get the melanoma without being stopped. Um, and then Flag three, um, you know, we're still figuring out how it actually works, but interestingly, it's on uh, CD4 cells, um, which I think about as kind of helping the CD8s, which are generally thought to be the effector or killer cells. And so we're getting points along the, the system where we can now intervene and allow an immune response that again, as a natural immune response, but the tumor's just taken advantage of it and modulate it in, in patients to get a, a response. So hopefully that's what you were looking for, that answer. Yeah, the, that was, uh, the, I, was, I was wondering how you would deal with the, with the lag tree and how, where exactly, which shelf it lived on. Yeah. Uh, so I have a sim similarly simple, easy question for Katie. Uh, Let's, uh, how do you approach a patient with stage 3B melanoma after they've had surgery? What are some of the questions that go through your mind? And do you come down on the side of targeted therapy or do you come down on the side of immunotherapy for somebody who has that choice? Hi. Um, well, that's a controversial question too. <laughs> Um, but I guess, you know, to, to piggyback on what we were just talking about with that DreamSeq trial, right? So I think what was so great about that trial in terms of offering us guidance for what to do for the stage four patient who has BRAF mutant melanoma, um, I would kind of maybe take that to your illustration of the stage 3B patient in the adjuvant setting um, and say that we're kind of in the same spot with the BRAF mutant melanoma patient in the stage three setting as we were just, you know, a couple of months ago with the stage four patient, right? So in the adjuvant setting, you know, do folks do better if they start with targeted therapy? Do they do better if they start with immunotherapy? Is there at all a rationale to switch, um, you know, in the middle? Um, and I know that's actually um, a research question that one of our cooperative groups, you know, SWOG, um, is uh, interested in um, you know, looking at a trial to investigate that. Um, you know, I think uh, even though longer, you know, true kind of the longer, longer term data um, in terms of how well patients do with adjuvant immunotherapy um, is, is not quite, I think, matching uh, what we have uh, in terms of long term data for adjuvant BRAF MEC. Um, I personally would extrapolate from the stage four data uh, and say that all things being equal. Um, if there's no contraindication to whatever therapy we have planned, um, that I would still recommend um, adjuvant therapy with the current standard of care, uh, which is an anti-PD-1 drug. Um, so nivolumab or pembrolizumab. Um, and I know that we're not really supposed to compare trials to trials. I think that um, in terms of looking at the length of time someone has before the disease come back, I think that there is an advantage there for immunotherapy. And I would also say that there is an advantage there for um, side effects, right? Um, again, there's nuances. You could argue back and forth. You can say that, well, with immunotherapy of potentially permanent or long lasting side effects, such as um, you know, thyroiditis or um, adrenal gland insufficiency, um, However, those are treatable, right? I would make the argument that those are treatable. Um, and uh, with the BRAF and MEK targeted therapies, it's not that you're in, you know, those also have side effects. They may be reversible, um, but on the clinical trials of adjuvant BRAF MEK, it was actually a higher percentage of patients who had side effects and a higher percentage of patients who had 
side effects of BRAF meth that made them need to come off therapy uh, and explore something else or maybe not being on drug at all. So um, again, maybe you could argue there's no right or wrong answer, but even for the BRAF mutant patient, I would argue for immunotherapy first. Not sure if Dr. Daniels or if you, you know, have a different practice um, at the moment. Greg, patient walks in to see you and uh, what, what would you do? Would you uh, pick immunotherapy or target therapy first? Well, I've already um, tilted my hand to my bias, so I kind of agree <laughs> I am immune therapy, but I got to admit that the targeted therapy data looks pretty good. You know, they have data out to five years and the risk of recurrence stays uh, separated for all that time. They're both one year of therapy. They're very different therapies. Um, so I think there's a role for targeted therapy for some patients might be the right choice and immune therapies might be the best choice for others. This really does beg the question, why haven't we ever had a trial that <laughs> compared the two? And we probably never will. Um, you know, you always have to be careful looking back at toxicities from one era to the next and saying that something's better than something else and blah, blah, blah. There's, there's nothing like a randomized trial to really sort all that out, but I think we'll probably never have that in this, in this area. Well, one of the interesting things I thought about DreamSeq was, I mean, I, I think you guys pointed to that separation of curves long-term, but one of the things that was interesting is that for a cooperative group trial, uh, the, the response rate percentage for immunotherapy didn't change. It was like 47%, but the response rate for target therapy was much lower. It was like 40 something percent, which I don't know if that's just a head scratcher that nobody really knows the answer to, or why could, why is there such a selective reduction in the response rate, you know? Um, yeah, no, I agree that it was that they had similar response rates was surprising to me because that's not in, in general practice what I, I see. Um, I don't have it's just one of those uh, one of those things. Uh, so how maybe I should turn to both of you and ask you, how do you treat a patient with uh, stage four melanoma who has brain metastases? What do you what's your what are the things that you look out for and what do we know today? Well, we know that um, our tools work to some degree. Um, both targeted therapies and immune therapies um, have activity in brain lesions. Um, but you know, the last couple of years, um, again, um, through trials, um, it's become pretty clear that if possible, that um, dual checkpoint therapy is the treatment of choice for a group of patients. The well kind of asymptomatic small number of lesions not on steroids you have to check off about 10 boxes but if you do then you know there is the opportunity to as dr sondek alluded to a couple times de-escalating care so for brain metastases a lot of times patients are looking at radiation or resections um, but if there's limited number um, lesions that aren't in you know, a critical place in the brain, uh, oftentimes we'll go ahead and just start uh, immune therapy, watch patients closely, of course have radiation oncology uh, following along with the patients too. Um, but um, I just literally today got a text from a patient who just completed a week of mountain biking in Utah um, who had immune therapy with brain nets and you know did really well with that. So it can happen, but uh, we just have to be uh, really on our toes. Okay, what, what's your approach to uh, somebody who has uh, brain metastases? Yeah, I mean, I agree that um, this is obviously a very serious situation and if there was ever a time to be aggressive in terms of our systemic treatment of someone with known brain involvement, you know, that is the time, right? Um, so I agree with combination immunotherapy. Um, I believe, you know, a couple of years ago at ASCO, um, you know, Dr. Talby at MD Anderson had given the oral presentation for Checkmate you know, 204, which is looking at the activity of combination IPI plus NEVO in patients with brain metastases. 
um, showing that you know about you know half will have a response in the brain. Um, you know, to your point earlier, though, I mean that's kind of the the healthiest of those patients, right? In a perfect situation, it would be folks who were not requiring steroids for control of their symptoms, um, and you know, fairly small metastases, not in critical areas. Um, so. You know, we may have made huge leaps and bounds in the past 10 years in terms of medical therapies, but I'm also not, or we, a medical oncology, are also not so high up on our horses probably to say that if someone needs radiation, if someone needs neurosurgery um, for kind of faster um, relief of um, you know, any tumors that are impinging on critical areas, I still think that those are important things to have in our, our toolkits. Um, I guess maybe just to take that one step further, you know, um, you know, Dr. Doomer at ASCO this year did present the results um, or some results from Trecotel, which was triplet therapy. Um, those were, that was a, a trial population of BRAF mutant patients with, uh, or BRAF mutant melanoma patients, I could, I should say, um, who had known brain involvement. And the, the study combination there was uh, targeted therapy plus immunotherapy. So it was a PDL1 drug um, plus venurafenib plus cobimetinib. So a, a different set of BRAF plus MEK inhibitors. Um, from what I recall there, you know, I think the response rate in the brain was actually quite high. It was over 50% uh, percent, close to 60%. Um, but what kind of caught my attention was that the trial population there, you know, a, a higher percentage of those patients um, had you know, were requiring steroid um, for symptom control. Uh, and I think a fair number of those patients also uh, were uh, quite high risk, you know, with uh, an elevated LDH or lactate dehydrogenase, which some of you may know um, uh, in folks with metastatic melanoma, um, that is something that we can use to track, you know, how well um, the disease is responding or not to therapy. Um, so, you know, again, I think that's probably a whole nother discussion, the role of, you know, what role does triplet therapy play um, in management of a stage four patient? But you know, I just wonder that, you know, for the patient who is very symptomatic and maybe requiring a lot of steroids and maybe has already gotten radiation plus minus surgery, you know, would a triplet therapy be something to consider as opposed to combination immunotherapy on its own? Yeah, can I just comment one thing? And that is to turn it around on the 80 plus people that are listening because getting more advocacy for patients with brain metastases and, and um, getting them on to clinical trials. And it's not that they don't want to go on clinical trials, it's just that they're often excluded from clinical trials. Um, and so the more... Um, voices um, that are advocating for this group would be wonderful. I just had, again, today, a patient get excluded for incidentally found brain metastases, completely asymptomatic, but couldn't put them on study because I have to radiate him first. And um, so um, we need some help. And I also agree with uh, Katie about being aggressive it used to be that uh, brain metastases were a little bit of a hard stop um, because we didn't have a lot of good tools for that. But now I'm having frank discussions with my neurosurgeons to please take out that large lesion because I can take care of the rest um, and, um, and trying to change um, kind of the outlook uh, for some of these patients. So maybe I can uh, turn to... Uh, to uh... Uh, you guys both for a minute, and and maybe Katie, if you could talk about what are the some of the new developments in the targeted therapy area. I mean, we've talked about immunotherapy. I think we all collectively believe in immunotherapy for sure, but target therapy, where are we today? I mean, can we look to some advances or improvements, or are we pretty much? I would like to think there are still advances to be made in that area. Um, so to your point, you know, I, we are very immunotherapy focused um, for good reason. Um, but I, you know, I guess to my earlier point, let's not forget that you know, we 
have a known identified driver mutation in half of all melanomas that start on the skin and BRAF plus MEK inhibitors, they work. Um, they often work very quickly and um, I think are still an important um, toolkit option uh, to have. In terms of advances, um, you know, I think uh, you know, all of you may already be aware that there are three BREF MEC uh, combinations that are currently approved by the US FDA. Um, there's the Vemurafenib plus Cobimetinib, there's the Brafenib plus Trimetinib, uh, and then the newer kit on the block is Encorafenib plus Binimetinib. Um, I think some uh, interesting areas to think about are um, how to get around the problem of resistance, right? Um, I think uh, one, uh, just one example of a reason why some of us are so immunotherapy focused are that with the targeted therapies, you know that they work, um, but we also know that resistance can develop uh, sometimes quite quickly, um, that someone's melanoma can find a way to signal uh, around the block that the BRAF neck inhibitors put up. Um, and I think some interesting questions there are, you know, number one, how can we, um, you know, how can we uh, um, prevent that from happening so quickly? Are there ways to prevent resistance from developing? And I think the other question, because we were just talking about brain metastases is, um, is there a way that we can boost efficacy or penetration of the BRF and the MEK inhibitors into the central nervous system? Um, right now at UCSF, actually, we are running, I think, two uh, trials um, that are actually novel BRAF inhibitors. So these are not FDA approved uh, BRAF inhibitors that um, are designed in such a way that they have, we hope at least, um, increased penetration into the central nervous system. Um, so there is, I think, clearly a, a population in need. Um, and it's great to have these trials for precisely the reason that Dr. Daniels just said, right? I think a lot of um, clinical trials will exclude folks with active brain metastases but not obviously if it's a brain met uh, specific melanoma trial. Um, so those I think are some um, interesting areas that we're keeping tabs on. Um, and I know that we're kind of specifically focusing on the BRAF mutant uh, melanoma population. Um, I guess I just wanted to make a plug that, um, you know, for all of you out there, you know, who um, either have melanoma or had melanoma or have loved ones um, who are, are dealing with this diagnosis, um, my public service announcement for today is to please make sure that your doctor checks for other mutations besides BRAF. Um, there are a number of companies and institutions right now who do really kind of extensive genomic sequencing of someone's tumor. Um, often you'll hear things like next generation sequencing or, um, and uh, here at UCSF, we have an institutional platform for that. It's called UCSF 500. Um, Kaiser has Strata. Um, commercial uh, entities that do this have names like Tempest, um, uh, Keras, uh, you know, so many companies. Uh, and the reason to do it really is to think about alternative treatment strategies. Um, you know, uh, there are current FDA approved treatments um, that can be repurposed, if you will, um, for melanoma. For example, um, if someone's melanoma has an NRAS mutation, you know, we have clinical trial data showing that that activates a signaling pathway that can actually be blocked by administering a MEK inhibitor, such as trametinib or cobimetinib, um, some of the drugs I've mentioned before. Um, depending on what those next generation sequencing results show, um, they could also open up clinical trial eligibility. So um, a, a number of these molecular subtypes of melanoma um, have ongoing you know, clinical trials um, that we can uh, try to uh, uh, connect, connect you with. Um, so that's my little spiel on targeted therapy for, for this group. So a question from uh, Susan Kent. Uh, patients receiving immunotherapy that have side effects such as thyroid problems, adrenal insufficiency, autoimmune responses, and inflammatory joint disease, is research being done to improve those side effects? Um, Katie, is, is research being done to improve those side effects? What, what is the way forward for immune-related adverse events? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and actually here at UCSF, we are in the process of um, starting up a clinic, you know, specifically for uh, patients and providers uh, who are dealing with immune-related side effects. Um, so stay tuned for that. Um, I will say that, um, 
there are still a lot of really interesting questions and certainly a lot we don't know yet about why certain immune related side effects happen um, and why others don't. And at the same time, why some happen and are very severe and acute and life-threatening um, versus the other possible presentation, which is more kind of slow burning um, and waxing and waning over time. Um, for some of the specific side effects that were mentioned, you know, for example, um, the thyroiditis or adrenal insufficiency, um, I would say that probably there's ongoing research trying to figure out why exactly that happens. Um, and uh, perhaps that will eventually lead to um, some more research about you know, possible ways to prevent that from happening. Um, so I think that's uh, something certainly still ongoing. Um, a lot of the ways in which we manage immune-related side effects, I would say, you know, to date have really been consensus-driven um, and expert, um, uh, you know, really expert opinion-driven, uh, which I think is super important and it's gotten us to where we are today. Um, but at the same time, I think there is room to really start thinking about, um, you know, what trial data, you know, what more objective information can we add to collective knowledge so that we have some um, uh, uh, some more objective uh, data and numbers on you know whether one patient does better with a certain treatment or not. You know, for example, um, we all give steroids for immune related colitis. We were doing that 10 years ago too. Um, should we be giving some anti-inflammatory um, agents upfront um, you know instead of just relying on steroids? If so, which immunosuppressant should that be? Should it be infliximab? Should it be vedolizumab? There's one company that's coming out with an oral version of vedolizumab, if you will. So I think um, that probably is going to be in the future um, in terms of immune-related side effect management. Uh, and then uh, how would you, and, and maybe this is a question for everybody too, how would you keep check on melanoma with immunotherapy as adjuvant therapy? Or in other words, how do you know if the melanoma is not spreading if the original lesion is removed, is there some, how, how do we know? So I, you know, I, I wish many times um, that I had x-ray vision, uh, but I don't. Um, and so for folks on adjuvant therapy, I think, you know, one important part of this really is close monitoring with scans, you know, cross-sectional images, CT scans, for example. Um, that has some limitations, of course. Um, you know, tumors have to be a certain size before they can be seen on a scan. Um, I know that we there was some conversation earlier about you know CT DNA and what role that plays. Um, yeah, I, I certainly think that there's room for that to be uh, done concurrently with imaging. I don't think it replaces imaging at this point at all. Um, and also with CT DNA, since this is still an active area of research, you get into all these kind of thorny questions of, well, what do you do if that CT DNA level goes up? Does it mean that you start treatment? Does it mean you change anything? Probably not yet, um, but hopefully answers coming soon. Or maybe we'll have more to update you on that front um, after next year's ASCO. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, uh, one test that's not used enough or emphasized is just communications with the patients. <laughs> um, What's that? I've never heard of that before. It's called my chart. Or <laughs> and physical uh, exam or self exams. We're just um, patients know when something's not right. And so just um, having encouraging that communication um, and then scans kind of confirm it. I want to thank, uh, thank you all for attending and thank Dr. Daniels and Dr. Sai, uh, Dr. Maker, uh, Dr. Sondag uh, and, and uh, Dr. Alvarado and Dr. Bo Dr. Bay. Uh, thank you, Maria.